Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here. <clears throat> and we're talking about church planting models, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and we're his body. And we get to be a part, we get to partner with our Lord Jesus Christ in this great work of the kingdom. Praise God. Since Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and it's all about him, I think it will be fitting to start this out by reading Jesus' own words about the church. So with that in mind, let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Jesus actually makes very little mention of the church in his uh, teaching <clears throat> throughout the Gospels. He mentions the kingdom over and over and over. But the church, he makes one mention of building the church. It's very interesting. Matthew 16, 17 through 19. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Jesus says, I will build my church. We don't, because of time, we don't, have, we, we don't have the time to go over all the facets of this passage here, but <clears throat> that's the part that I want to draw attention to. Jesus said, I will build my church. Now let's go to the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So this is where our Lord commissions us to go out <clears throat> and to take this gospel of the kingdom to the whole world. So all the gospels contain a version of the Great Commission. He has definitely commissioned us to go. The commission has been repeated in all four gospels. But we must remember that Jesus never actually commanded us to plant churches. What did he tell us to do? He told us to go into all the world. He told us to preach the gospel of the kingdom. He told us to make disciples. And he told us to baptize them. So are we supposed to plant churches? Let's take a quick glimpse at some other verses in the New Testament in answering this question. Let's go to Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Where is Crete? If you look in the back of your Bibles, you'll find Paul's missionary journeys. <clears throat> and as far as I can tell, the only time Paul ever visited Crete was on his way to Rome towards the end of his life. He briefly stopped in, and apparently there were some converts made. Now, there could have been <clears throat> other... Uh, Preachers that perhaps had something to do with the work there. It may not all have depended on Paul. Nevertheless, there, was a, there, was, there were needs in Crete. And Paul sent Titus 
to go there and to set in order the things that are lacking. He was supposed to bring order to the church in Crete and appoint elders. Now let's go to 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. Something very similar. That might be the wrong reference. But anyway, Paul sent Timothy to do a similar work. To bring order into the church and to appoint elders. So we are supposed to be channels in church planting, but the power always remains in God's hands. And then along with that, let's go into what is a church? What is the church of Jesus Christ? So Jesus himself doesn't use the word church very often, but throughout the rest of the New Testament, the word church is used a lot. Revelation 1 verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So he gives us a picture of a lampstand which represents the church. What is a lampstand? It's a stand upon which they would place their little pottery lamps and, and that would give light to the house. In the old King James it's called a candlestick, but actually a more accurate word is a lampstand. So it's a metaphorical picture of what a church is. So what is a church? It's an assembly of believers who have a lampstand in their midst. As we continue reading here in Revelation, Jesus warns a number of the churches that if they did not repent, he would remove their lampstand. So Jesus is the one who places lampstands or removes lampstands. That power is in his hands. Church planting then, in essence, is gathering a group of believers and helping them meet the criteria for the planting of a lampstand. The lampstand is symbolic of Jesus' presence, his approval, and blessing. We can't plant lampstands, but we can help groups of believers to come together and meet the criteria so that Jesus himself will come and plant a lampstand. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible that we get to partner with our Lord Jesus Christ and help people form groups of believers, communities of believers, where Jesus himself will come and plant a lampstand. The lampstand is representative of authenticity and power. What do I mean by authenticity? It's real. It's a real church. If there's a group of believers with a lamp stand in their midst, that's Jesus' stamp of saying, this is a real church. I am here. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. So can two or three people be a church? Well, In the most basic form, yes. One person is not a church. Two or three can potentially be a church, although typically there's more involved, more people. The lampstand is representative of authenticity and power. So the church of Jesus Christ always depends on the power of God. It is not merely intellectual, organizational. It depends on a continual flow of the power of God. God uses human vessels to do the work, but ultimately Jesus is the one who holds the authority to give or take the lampstand. Church planting always requires a miracle. Hallelujah. The church is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Something so precious 
And Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He is the chief cornerstone. He says, I will build my church. It is his church. He owns the church. All right. <clears throat> so the church, when did it start? Some people say it started in the Old Testament. Some people say it started clear in the beginning. But the New Testament church, as we know it today, started on the day of Pentecost. That's when it started. When Jesus, after <clears throat> ascending to the Father, poured out the Holy Spirit on the believers. On the day of Pentecost, the New Testament church was officially launched. And so when we talk about the church, we're talking about from Pentecost onward. And it is important to clarify this because the New Testament church serves a risen, ascended Savior and is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. All right. So, so we went over what Jesus mentioned about the church very briefly. Now we're going to continue on into the book of Acts. Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. To me, this is the introduction to the whole book of Acts. The believers received the power of the Holy Spirit and that empowerment sent them out to fulfill the work of the Great Commission. So all effective kingdom work is inspired, guided, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So now we're going to go through the book of Acts and we're going to look at the planting of churches. Uh, before I do that, I just want to make a comment <clears throat> as, as way of introduction. So soon after we were married, someone gave me a book. The title of the book is Missionary Methods, St. Paul's or Ours by Roland Allen. And I read that book without knowing the context, without knowing the impact that book has had on many, so many people. But I read that book and it really impacted me. But you know, I think that the, the, the biggest thing that impacted me about that was Roland Allen's thesis, the underlying truth that he's trying to get across in writing that book is that the Bible is the authority. The Bible is the pattern for all church planting and all mission work. And so we can study all the missiology that we want, but it all has to go back to the Bible. And so with that in mind, let's look through the Bible and let's see how it was done. Okay, church planting in the book of Acts. Well, let's just start out with the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> Acts 2, verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord, again, added to the church daily those who were being saved. Adding to. So first, Jesus himself established the church. He put a lampstand in the midst of that group of assembled believers on the day of Pentecost. The church was established through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Next, souls were baptized and added to the original core group. Strictly speaking, adding to is not church planting. Nevertheless, the obvious conclusion is that through numerical growth, the Jerusalem church multiplied, and so either congregations or cell groups were established. In summary, there was first a core group, and new believers were added to 
that initial group. This is a valid method of church expansion and growth. The con concept of ecclesia, or an organized local assembly, was firmly established as the modus operandi for all followers of Jesus Christ. Being a follower of Jesus normally includes being baptized into a local body and continuing in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. There are isolated individual Christians in some parts of the world. There are Christians who have been imprisoned for their faith, have not had the opportunity of participating in a local body. Because of persecution and other reasons, there have been people who have not had that privilege. But the normal way is for believers to be part of a local body and be part of that lampstand experience. So the word, the Greek word, where we get our word church was ecclesia, which basically meant an assembly, a gathering of people. But any gathering is not a church, not a church of Jesus Christ. And so... <clears throat> A valid church of Jesus Christ, a valid congregation, has to have two aspects, at least two. One is the gathering part. And so God's way is for people to gather, to get together and encourage each other, uh, that there be teaching of the word and, and a brotherhood experience. And along with that is the lampstand. So not every gathering which calls itself a church is actually a church. Only the ones who have the lampstand placed there by Jesus Christ. Being a follower of Jesus normally includes participation in a local body. Yet God is the final judge. The scriptures talk about being members of the body. We must be careful to express this in scripturally accurate ways. This was not written to give credence to sectarian membership. Some groups consider themselves to be the only church. That is not scriptural. Wherever God finds a group of sincere believers and God puts his candlestick there, there is an authorized church. This is so much more than merely having one's name on a membership role. If you have your name on a membership role, but you don't go to church, you don't meet, you don't assemble, that's not really membership either. My understanding of church membership is that it should be spiritually functional membership. Spiritual in the sense that it's God in all of our hearts pulling us together and moving in our midst. And it's functional in that we regularly meet and go through the functions of a church a spiritually functional membership. So <clears throat> that's the day of Pentecost. People were added to the church. And out of that, obviously, we don't know how they worked all of that out, but we assume there were maybe cell groups or house churches or something multiplied out of that numerical growth because uh, Logistically, it's hard to bring 3,000 people together every Sunday, right? Okay, so the next story that I want to cover in the book of Acts is Philip going down to Samaria. In Acts 8, verse 5, it says that Philip went to Samaria and preached Christ. This is the first description of church planting outside of Jerusalem. Samaria was close to Jerusalem geographically, ethnically, and culturally. So Philip went to Samaria, preached Christ to them. The Bible tells us later on in the book of Acts that Philip was an evangelist. And we're going to go back to that detail uh, further on. So Philip the evangelist went to Samaria, preached Christ... And then Peter and John went down to Samaria, laid hands on them. The elders from, Jer from the Jerusalem church gave spiritual support to regional church planting. 
There's a book that uh, is part of the church planting course called Global Church Planting. I would highly recommend that all of you read through that. It's not the Bible, but it, it, it has a lot of very insightful thoughts that are helpful in, in processing the Bible narrative. Global church planting. So <clears throat> in that book, there's a, a section in there on different types of church planters. They would categorize what Peter and John did as, as uh, a catalytic church planter. In other words, they didn't move down to Samaria and they didn't relocate the Samarians up to Jerusalem. They left them down there and they stayed in, and Peter and John stayed in Jerusalem. They went down and gave help to them and they helped them get started. This is a valid model for church planting. They don't, we don't have to always do it the same. There are different situations and God has given us different ways of going about it in different situations. And so Philip was an evangelist. He went to an area not too far away and helped them uh, start a church. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that it wasn't too far away. He could have said, hey, you know what? Why don't you guys all move up to Jerusalem? But he didn't do that. He went down there and helped them get started. Very interesting. The next story I want to cover is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. <clears throat> Desert opportunities. So the Ethiopian eunuch was traveling through the desert, uh, sitting in his chariot and reading the Old Testament. Philip went to him and expounded the word of God, baptized him, and the Holy Spirit caught him away. So... <clears throat> God gave Philip a narrow window of opportunity with that man. Philip handled it strategically. He did what God told him to do. The Holy Spirit was involved the whole way through. The Holy Spirit told him to go there. And when he was finished, the Holy Spirit caught him away. And so we cannot criticize what Philip did. This was uh, directed by the Lord. And Philip was an evangelist, remember. Remember. The time Philip spent with the Ethiopian was short but strategic. Philip was an evangelist. He was faithful to what God called him. We must be careful when evaluating the methods of kingdom workers. Other kingdom workers perhaps do things differently than what I do. And we must be careful in evaluating their methods or the stories that we read from history. So often we do as the Corinthians. We say, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus or I have Cephas. In evaluating the stories from history, there are many lessons to be learned. We must exercise spiritual discernment. And yes, we must learn all we can from history. So I personally was involved in a situation where <clears throat> we were ministering to people within a very narrow window of opportunity. I had the privilege of working with refugee people and they were traveling through and there was, not a, there was not sufficient time to actually organize or plant churches, as we would say. And so we had a, a narrow window of opportunity. What should we do when we have narrow windows of opportunity? The Holy Spirit directed Philip and showed him what to do. According to history, the Ethiopian eunuch went back to Ethiopia and there was an extensive work uh, carried on from that point on. He was faithful. He was um, used of God to continue the work in his home country. There's a young man from our home church who has been working with refugees in southern Mexico. And, and sometimes it's frustrating because they're continually moving through. But God gives us these opportunities and we must be faithful. The next story that I want to touch on in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, Peter and Cornelius. So Cornelius was the first Gentile who was brought into the church, as we might say. This is the first truly cross-cultural church plant. And Peter obviously was not trained in cross-cultural evangelism. 
Okay, he didn't go through a church planting course. That's very obvious. He gets into Cornelius' house and the first thing he blurts out is, you know how unlawful it is for a Jew to go into a man who is a Gentile. <laughs> but Peter was led step by step by the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to bring our, our attention back to is <clears throat> the whole way through we go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You shall receive power. We are, we are guided, empowered, and led by the Holy Spirit the whole way through. So now we have another narrative in the book of Acts. Acts. We have Paul's missionary journeys. Now, in the book that I referenced, Church Planting Methods, St. Paul's or Hours, Roland Allen <clears throat> largely focuses on Paul's missionary journeys. And that really left an impact on my life, on my perspective, on my worldview. And um, <clears throat> so as Brother Harold mentioned, we've been living among tribal people for the last 15 years, but my history goes back uh, a few years before that. In fact, my journey in this topic of church planting really goes back to my childhood. When I was six months old, my parents packed us up and moved to Paraguay. And that was my first exposure to cross-cultural Maybe church planting, maybe church transplanting, but it was, it was an experience that awakened us as a family to cross-cultural kingdom work. And in January of 1998, I moved to Mexico and I've been there ever since. And so that's about uh, 26 years that I've been working in, in all of this stuff and I have been on a journey been on a really interesting journey. <clears throat> and so I read Roland Allen's book on church planting, Missionary Methods. <clears throat> and I started out with lots of zeal and with the idea that I'm going to do it Paul's way. After maybe 10 years of working along those lines, the Lord gently told me, you're not the Apostle Paul. And that's true. I am not the Apostle Paul. <laughs> we can learn all we, all we, hopefully we will, will learn all we possibly can from Paul and his missionary journeys. But let's remember, I am not Paul. All right. Paul's missionary journeys. In summary, I would say this is apostolic church planting taking the gospel to previously unreached people in a cross-cultural setting. In describing Paul's work, the book of Acts focuses mostly on evangelism and discipleship. Minimal mention is made of organizing the believers into churches, also known as church planting. Yet if we follow the, the story of Paul's work through the rest of the New Testament, it is obvious that ecclesia or church, was assumed and practiced. What was Paul's organizational strategy? I've gone through the book of Acts trying to find what was Paul's organizational strategy, and I can't find much. Honestly, it's, it pretty much boils down to one verse. Acts 14, verse 23 so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. That's his organizational strategy right there. When they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. In the very next verse, and after they had passed through and they kept, kept traveling. Was that the end of the story? Remember we, we read about Timothy and Titus going back 
and helping with uh, leadership establishment in some of these places. So Paul didn't just abandon them. He didn't just bring the gospel, ordain leaders, and then permanently leave them. He had a continued interest in the work and a continual ongoing sense of responsibility to, to disciple or to send other people who could disciple them. All right. Now, let's think back over all these stories that we've, got, we've touched on in the book of Acts, and let's see what we can learn from this. <clears throat> now, like I say, my journey has been rather long, and just as a brief uh, glimpse into my life, I spent four years traveling to a village with the intent of planting a church there, Every week I traveled an hour uh, to a different village and preached there for four years. After four years, they told me I didn't need to come back. And so when we go through these kinds of experiences, we learn. Maybe they didn't learn much, I don't know, but I learned. I learned a lot. And so... God will take us through experiences, difficult experiences, but we're learning. And we're not just planting churches, but we ourselves are being prepared for eternity. And I'm excited about that. These experiences are not wasted. God is doing a work in me, preparing me for eternity. So, now, <clears throat> I repeat Roland Allen, in his book, Missionary Methods, St. Paul's or Ours, proposes the thought that the New Testament is the pattern for church planting. The stories are more than just history. They are the foundation for missiology. With that in mind, let's look at whether these stories are prescriptive, descriptive, or normative. For more on that, you can look in the book, Global Church Planting, page 45. So prescriptive means that we are expected to do it exactly this way. Are the stories in the book of Acts prescriptive? Is God telling us exactly how he wants it done? Or are they descriptive? Are they simply written for our learning, but not necessarily meant to be copied? Or are they normative? And I want to just read one paragraph out of the book, Global Church Planting. Page 45, he says, In a third category, we place those consistent patterns that carry representative value by the use of repetition, literary emphasis, and other devices. The author makes them stand out as normal, parentheses, customary or typical practices even if they are not given normative, parentheses, absolute authoritative force. Patterns with representative force are, number one, repeated consistently. Thus, only one pattern is found. Number two, stand in harmony with the rest of Scripture. And number three, are not unique to a particular context or culture. In this chapter, we will call them church planting patterns. This chapter highlights some of the more salient principles that can, in our judgment, be generally applied to church planting efforts. These consistent patterns can be used to develop ministry principles, provided they are, number one, based on clear parallels between the contemporary situation and the biblical context, and number two, adapted to current ministry realities in their application. So we do not seek to imitate the events and methods of Acts, but we do seek to learn from them and apply the principles. So these are church planting patterns. The book of Acts gives us the pattern for church planting. This is not merely descriptive. And it's not necessarily, a lot, most of it is not necessarily prescriptive, that we have to do it exactly that way, but it's normative. God gives us patterns, and then the Holy Spirit leads us in every situation, and we must be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy, 
The Bible, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, must be our authority and guide in church planting. And I want <clears throat> to emphasize this thought of the Bible illuminated by the Holy Spirit being our authority and guide in church planting and in every area of life. As I've studied church history and read uh, the writings and biographies of the what we would call the heroes of the faith, it's very outstanding how they always had a very high regard for the Word of God. One of Menno Simon's biographers said, he was a fearless leader who aimed at complete loyalty to the Word of God. Was he perfect? No. But he was an outstanding leader and he aimed at complete loyalty to the Word of God. John Bunyan, in his book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, describes how he found his way through all of his many struggles and fears by standing firmly on the Word of God. Not my interpretation of the Word of God, but the, Holy, the Bible illuminated by the Holy Spirit. We don't flip through our Bible trying to find uh, verses to support our ideas. We bring ourselves to the Word of God and allow God to change us. Whatever, you, whatever success you, you have in, in missiology, in church planting, it will have to go back to the Word of God. All the great heroes of the faith built their lives squarely on the Word of God. In reading the biographies of many heroes of the faith, their extraordinary dedication to the Word of God is usually evident. They were continually being changed by the Word of God. They were not using the Word to back up their sectarian propaganda. Okay, timeless principles that the Word of God teaches in relation to church planting. The accounts of, the church, of church growth in the New Testament are primarily normative. The book of Acts is the historical account of how the early believers fulfilled the Great Commission through the power of the Holy Spirit. These accounts were written for our learning. The New Testament should be our primary textbook on missiology. We must have faith in the Word of God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit both in our own lives and in the lives of our spiritual children. The Word of God must change me and it must change the people I'm ministering to, and it is sufficient, the Word of God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts describes leadership as being authoritative, but not authoritarian. Church meetings had order, but were not liturgical. All, be all believers benefit from fellowship, but not from fear-oriented control. Networks of fellowship are beneficial, but denominational exclusivism is not. We must teach and shepherd new believers, but not force them into our ethnocentric molds. Disciple making and church planting must be directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So now, <clears throat> let's move on into some lessons from history. And I would like to read some verses in Ecclesiastes as a as an introduction to looking at some lessons from history. <clears throat> I'm going to be reading Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. As I read this, let's think of this in the context of missions and church planting. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 6, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. This makes me think of abundant sowing, abundant evangelism. <coughs> if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. That's the one I want to give most emphasis to. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If I am full of God, Wherever I go, there will be, as Paul said, the aroma of Christ. If we don't get the methods figured out, that's okay. We have to be full of God. 
And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Many of the mission fields do not, do not look promising. And if we observe the outward <clears throat> uh, indications, sometimes we won't look at it as a promising mission field. But God knows. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Very true. In the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand. Young and old alike, let us be generous in sowing. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. So with that in mind, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. <clears throat> in the church planting course, there are two articles. One is by Hans Kostdorf, the Anabaptist Appro Approach to Missions. And the other is the Moravian Mission Machine by Dean Taylor. Neither of these articles focuses very much on the organizational part of church planting. But what, they, what is very, very outstanding and very evident is the Anabaptist people and the Moravians <clears throat> were full of God. Wherever they went, there was an aroma of Christ. And that, that made the difference. We must be full of God if we're ever going to be effective in kingdom work and in church planting. I highly recommend those two articles. We don't have time to make a lot of comments, but um, please find those articles and read them. Very, very good articles. In both of these examples, we see how there was, number one, unswerving obedience to the word of God. <clears throat> they tried. Not saying they got everything right, but they tried. Number two, absolute surrender to God. Number three, walking in the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. Number four, church unity. Number five, avoiding of extra-biblical innovations. What are extra-biblical innovations? Sometimes throughout history, people have presumed to change the structure of the church, the, the naming of different functions of the church, perhaps have called it an army, which is somewhat biblical, but, you know, are church leaders pastors or are they lieutenants? Let's be careful that we don't change what the Bible has laid out. Jesus is the head of the church. The church is his bride. We dare not touch it or change it or, or adulterate <clears throat> what God wants to do. Now let's move on to church planters. So going back to the story of Philip, Philip was an evangelist, and he was faithful in what God called him to do. He didn't plant churches, at least he had very little to do with the organizing of churches. In sending out Bible translators and community development facilitators, we need to consider their spiritual gifting. I repeat, Philip was an evangelist, and he worked according to his gifting. So I would encourage you to, again, read the book, Global Church Planting, page 91. It has a very interesting uh, outlay of <clears throat> different types of church planters. Keep in mind, these books are only intended as tools. The Bible remains our only authority. Global, Global Church Planting mentions three types of church planters who also represent three different approaches to church planting. A, the pastoral church planter. The pastoral church planter moves into an area, plants a church, and continues as pastor of that church. Valid in some situations. B, a catalytic church planter. The catalytic church planter plants a church, then uses that church as a platform from which to mobilize the planting of daughter churches in the region. I personally know a brother from India, and I believe that many of their church planting efforts have been along these patterns. Someone will go into an unreached area, um, help to uh, start a church, 
And then out of that church, daughter churches will be planted and the, the work will grow from there, a valid church planting pattern. And then there's the apostolic church planting pattern. The apostolic church planter or team typically moves on at some point. So the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys is usually referenced as the pattern for apostolic church planting. Go in, disciple, evangelize and disciple, and then eventually move on and put local leadership in place. Apostolic can refer to the method to evangelize, disciple, develop local leadership, and move on while continuing to provide consultancy. But apostolic can also refer to the gifting. Apostolic gifting refers to the call and anointing to delegate authenticity and power to a community of believers. And not everyone has that gifting. So in sending out uh, Bible translators and community development facilitators, it would do us well to consider the spiritual gifting of those going out or the gifting of the team. Okay, next I want to talk a little bit about indigenous church planting. <clears throat> so indigenous church planting uh, is a term that, was, that began to be used about 150 years ago. Previous to that, uh, there were colonial missions. People would go out and buy up a piece of land, form a compound, and then usually had a school and a clinic and a number of different things on that compound. And it was financed from, from Europe primarily. There was a man by the name of Henry Venn who proposed the idea that that's not biblical, but that rather we should <clears throat> release the local believers to go on with the work. He said that a church should be self-governing self-supporting and self-propagating. And biblically, as we look at the book of Acts, that's what the churches did. Churches were planted and those churches were able to govern themselves. They actually were, they actually had men who were capable of, of, of leading the church from among themselves. They were able to financially support their own work and they were actually able to reproduce. So is this a, an ideal method, indigenous church planting? Really, it's the only way to, to see much movement or multiplication. As long as a church is dominated or led or controlled by foreign missionaries, it probably will not spread much. For a church to become evangelistic and, and reproductive, the local people need to feel like it's their church, their work. They're responsible for it. Indigenous church planting refers to the process of planting churches which are led by local native people. They may or may not be connected to an international network. Indigenous does not necessarily mean that they have no connections. They can have connections, fellowship with people of other countries, other areas, but they still are responsible for the work themselves. Certainly, efforts should be made to help them form some level of fellowship with other congregations. Indigenous does not mean we plant a, an isolated congregation and walk off and leave them. That's not what indigenous means. Being indigenous does not mean that a church is isolated from other churches. The central point in indigenous church planting is allowing the local native people to own and lead the congregation and to have the freedom to make church decisions on their own. Another point is allowing them as a hermeneutical community to make biblical applications in culturally sensitive ways. We've grown up studying the Bible and seeking to apply that to our, to our lives in practical ways. In other cultures, those applications will look different. And those people as a community need to 
read the Word of God, seek the Lord, and, and, and understand how to apply the Bible in their context. We don't understand all the uh, intricacies of their, con- of their culture. They need to own it and learn how to go on with the work themselves. In thinking of indigenous church planting, there are two concepts which are somewhat different. One is indigenization. Indigenization is the idea that the foreigner comes in, plants the church, gets everything going, gets everything in place, and then trains locals to take over slowly. There's another concept which is indigeneity, which refers to coaching the locals in establishing their own church. I really believe it takes a balance of indigenization and indigeneity. There's a sense in which we need to come in and model the Christian life, but there's also a sense in which they need to, right from the start, they need to be responsible for things. And in our work among the Tarumara people, that's what we've attempted to do, is, is bring them into leadership right from the start, right from day one. Usually a balance of these two concepts is healthy. Jesus sent us to teach, not control. Another common Anabaptist method of church planting is colonizing to a developing country or within America, intermarrying and establishing themselves more or less permanently. There is nothing inherently wrong with this method. However, this is not always feasible or desirable. Reasons that this may not be feasible or desirable. Okay, so I think we're all understanding this, right? Colonization, taking a swarm of several people to a different area, relocating them, and starting a church. This could properly be termed church transplanting rather than church planting in many instances. Is this desirable? In some cases, it's just simply not feasible due to persecution. You can't bring uh, six or eight families into some of these communities because of persecution. Ethnic patriotism. Where where I live, it's it's a Native American reservation. You just simply cannot... They're not going to accept a whole swarm of of, uh, foreigners coming into their community. They won't let, let, let you do that. So in that case, it's not feasible. The cost involved. Uh, Thank God we have an abundance of finances, but not everyone in this world has enough finances to relocate uh, a half a dozen families to a different area. Sometimes the cost is just simply makes it inaccessible or the lack of available people. Sometimes there are places in this world where you just simply can't get enough people to do a swarm, a colonization. And one more is the concern for the future of our families. Is it always desirable to move permanently into a tribal area and to think of our children intermarrying and living there permanently? Is that what God wants? I don't think it's always feasible or desirable to colonize. And so in that instance, what needs to happen is what we could call apostolic church planting. We come in, we help the planting of a church, and we move on. And we put local people in charge. All right, I have a few more comments here. There's a, <clears throat> there's a methodology that's really being promoted among missions nowadays called the church planting movement model or the disciple making movement model. And so we're going to abbreviate that to CPM slash DMM. So CPM, church planting movements or disciple making movements is a method of indigenous church planting. It is where they mobilize everyone to go out and they try to make this chain reaction that that just explodes in a community. CPM, DMM is a method of indigenous church planting. However, it certainly is not the only method and perhaps not the most biblical method. So 
I'm not going to categorically uh, criticize it or discredit the method, but I just want to mention a few points. <coughs> Some of the strong points of CPM. I actually had to go through a five-day course on, on uh, DMM uh, missiology, and so I sort of got the inside scoop on a lot of this stuff. A focus on discipleship and relationship. Some people have the idea that DMM is all about just mushrooming the whole thing and not discipling people. Actually, it's not true. These guys are very focused on personal relationships and discipling people and mentoring people. That's a strong point. A mobilization of every member for kingdom work. That's a good point. Mobilizing everyone to be involved in the kingdom. Some weak points of CPM methodology. Sometimes unbiblical methods are used. I want to comment on the exclusive use of the discovery Bible study method. Some of these guys are promoting the idea that we don't preach or we don't teach people in evangelism. We just simply give them the word of God and help them to discover the truths among themselves as unbelievers. Not saying that unbelievers can't discover the truths of God's word, but if we reduce it to an exclusive method, Socrates is the one that de developed the discovery method of learning. It's really not completely biblical. Let's be careful. Some of the men involved in promoting the CPM DMM method, I believe are evangelists. And I'm not criticizing their gifting or their, all of their methodology, but sometimes it doesn't provide all the aspects. For example, New Testament ecclesia or the assembly, forming them, helping them to establish a solid church. We must always be careful to go back to the word of God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We must avoid the ruts of methodology. There are so many methods out there nowadays and it's easy for some of us to fall into a rut and push a certain methodology. The Bible does not have one methodology. The book of Acts describes several different patterns that were valid and the Holy Spirit needs to guide us in every situation. There is no silver bullet that's going to make us successful. We must be guided step by step by the Holy Spirit. And <clears throat> the shape of the church. Okay, so if we're planting indigenous churches, obviously the, indig the local people, the native people are going to have something to say about these, these uh, topics. But as teachers, we also must give them some biblical principles. Referencing again the book Global Church Planting, page 114, three prototypes are mentioned. <coughs> House church, voluntary gathered congregation, and cell celebration church. Very quickly, a house church is just simply a very informal gathering of believers in homes. Voluntary gathered congregation, that's a term they're using for the traditional American model. And three, cell celebration church, that's typically large congregations that have small cell groups. So the cell groups meet in homes and are pers develop personal relationships. And then the whole conglomerate group of cells meets together, typically once a week, and has a celebration service. Those are three prototypes that they mention. And again, we're not necessarily saying that one is the exclusive method or that much better than the others, uh, depending on the type of culture and situation that we're working in. But I would recommend reading that and praying over it and thinking about the Word of God. So I've done a lot of thinking about the shape of the church. And I just want to share some personal observations that I really feel could be helpful. So the prototype that I'm going to suggest to you as the most biblical and the most resilient is a fourth model. So <clears throat> instead of cell-celebration, consider 
small church dash celebration. Okay, that's a lot of stuff to wrap our minds around. To simplify the terminology, we're just going to call it a house church network. Okay, small church, sorry, small church network. Um, <clears throat> we need small groups from time to time. We need intimacy. And we also need the stability of larger uh, connections. And so I believe that God really wants us to be part of something small at times and also part of something larger. And we need both. Some people have only a small house church and it becomes unstable. Some people are part of a large congregation and never have the intimacy of the small congregation. And there again, we lose the blessing of the intimacy. I really believe that we need both. We need, sometimes we need to gather in small groups and have intimate fellowship. And there are other times we need the stability of the larger network. Pray about these things. God will lead us. So a, a definition of the small church network is a conglomerate network of autonomous congregations with a rhythmic alternation between large and small gatherings. Biblical principles concerning the shape of the church, the priesthood of all believers. Each believer has access to God through prayer and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Number two, brotherhood. The clergy laity divide is unbiblical. <coughs> the worship service should never become a theatrical show. Participation of every member. Every believer should be encouraged to exercise his measure of grace. Shepherding and relationships. Jesus taught us to not copy the methods used among the rulers of the Gentiles. We need shepherding and relationships. And sadly, that's very lacking in most of Western uh, Christianity. Very little shepherding and relationships. May God give us grace to do that and to model that. Leadership development and mobilization. Jesus thought about the, the um, <clears throat> rulers of the Gentiles who lorded over people and squash any perceived uh, competition. But among God's people, this is way too common. We have uh, dictator leaders who squash anything they perceive as competition. Jesus modeled and taught servant leadership. We must help each other forward. What about the venue? What type of building is the best model for church planting? I'm just going to give a few comments. It must be economically sustainable, not too expensive, and reproducible. In other words, if we put huge amounts of money into our buildings, it's not reproducible, not fast anyway. <clears throat> and it must be conducive to brotherhood. Seek God about the details. Some years ago, I was praying, and I said, Lord, how do you want us to set up the chairs? Something as simple as how to arrange the chairs in our meeting. And God told me, set them up so that you can see each other's faces. I'm not pushing that on anyone else. But I prayed about it, and I felt like God gave me an answer. I want to encourage all who are involved in church planting, pray about these things. Seek the Lord about the details. Uh, just a few more quick comments. <clears throat> tent making. Tent making is a, is a term that's commonly used to refer to missionaries uh, working a secular job to provide their own income. And that's taken from the Apostle Paul's example where he says that he provided for the needs of, his own, of himself and his team by building tents. The two... <clears throat> accounts from history that were referenced, the Moravians and the Anabaptists were entirely bivocational. That means they worked a secular job, they supported themselves besides preaching. And if someone would do me the favor of bringing my book up called Global Church Planting, uh, it's misplaced somewhere, I think it's over here, someone knows where it is. 
I would like to read a, a paragraph out of that book. Oh, sorry, I do have it. Sorry, I have it written right here. Page 320, the Moravian missionaries, the strongest missionary force of their day, were entirely bivocational. Today, tent making has become a significant factor in missions, especially in creative access places. In other words, places where it's difficult to get in and get paperwork, where traditional missionaries cannot obtain visas. The North American Mission Board of the Southern Baptists writes, we agree with Dr. Henry T. Black Abbey that Unleashing and equipping lay people is our best strategy to reach North America for Christ. It is time to release God's people as the Holy Spirit directs them and to encourage them to do what they did in the New Testament. If the lay people ever catch God's pattern for using them in church planting, the nation and world could come to hear God's news in our generation. What does it mean mobilizing lay people? These are people who are not yet ready to be ordained, but they're born again and they have the life of Christ within them. We must help each other to go out and to work in God's kingdom. Not everyone has to be ordained as an elder. So I just want to briefly mention prayer. Now prayer is not necessarily typically included in church planting strategy. But I'm going to tell you that if you don't pray, you're not going to plant churches. Prayer and spiritual disciplines. The practice of spiritual disciplines should be well established. In many cross-cultural settings, church planters must nourish their spiritual life without the support of an established local church. Many find that they must develop new or deeper patterns of spiritual disciplines because those practiced at home are inadequate on the church planting battlefront. Let me read that again. Many find that they must develop new or deeper patterns of spiritual disciplines because those practiced at home are inadequate on the church planting battlefront. Research on 100 effective church planters by Dick Grady and Glenn Kendall found that prayer is the number one factor for success in church planting. The church planter who has not established an effective prayer life and ministry will not go far. A church planter in Quito, Ecuador made this troubling observation. While we devote much time, energy, and money to rallies and crusades, we have neglected the apostolic method of church growth. What is the apostolic method of church growth? The apostles said we will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. E.M. Bounds said God's plan is to make much of the man, far more of him than of anything else. Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. Think of the Moravians. They were the strongest missionary force of their day. They sent missionaries to all parts of the globe. What was the secret of their success in church planting? Their prayer. They established a prayer chain that went on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there was such vision for that, they kept that prayer chain going for 100 years. God bless you. Let's, let's ask Elisha a few questions. Got a little time for that. Thank you, Elisha. So I appreciated the story you shared about four years, once a week, going to preach. God bless you for uh, opening up your life like that. <clears throat> I'm curious if you would, reflecting on that, tell us what you would do differently now. Uh, obviously, you've been involved in other church planting since then. What were you doing then that you wouldn't do now if you could do it over again? Very, very good question. <clears throat> so one of the main lessons that I feel like God definitely taught me out of that was to not build on another man's foundation. So there was already something going there, and we tried to come in and build on another man's foundation. And honestly, I don't think God called us there. We saw needs, and we were looking for something to do, but I don't really think God had called us there. However, on a more positive note, there was one person who 
whenever we were dismissed from the village, there was one person who said, come over to my village. She had been attending our services. We had baptized her. She invited us into her, into her home, and so we started having services in her home. And that grew, and we eventually rented a small building. And there was a Tatomara brother that started attending that service, that little mission, and invited us to the mountains. So the, the good side of it is that God is sovereign, and he redeemed the situation. You referenced um, the swarm type of missions. Um, I guess it's more commonly called just, you know, we're starting an outreach. But one of my first um, concerns about that type of missions, which is common to all of us, I'm sure, is that we bring along all of what we consider normal. So you, you have six American families in Spanish Mexico or Colombia or somewhere else, you're still an American church. You might speak Spanish, but you still think very much like an American. Do you have any comments on that, that concern? Well, <clears throat> is there anything wrong with six American families moving to South America and learning Spanish? Not really. There really isn't anything wrong with that. But if we're going to equip local, native, indigenous, autochthonous people to go on with church in their context, then somehow we're going to have to separate our ethnocentric background and ideas from what they have. <clears throat> and so I think that's been, that's, that has crippled many church planting, um, what's the word, uh, attempts in many places. So, the, so that's exactly what I grew up with when I was a young boy, you know, was, was a, a situation where there had been a swarm, had gone to South America and established themselves and as far as I know, things are still, still going on there, but there are not very many native people. It's still an American uh, colony, and some have intermarried, and there are a few natives there. But, if we're, but I think that the goal of, of ABT and of this uh, Bible translation effort is to equip people in other cultures to then you know, become God's people and go on with the work of the church. And if they're going to go on with it, it's going to have to be in their hands. We'll have, we'll have to trust them. Not trust them, but trust God through them. Trust that God is able through anyone, in any condition, in any part of the world, God is able to raise up his church and, and take them on. You mentioned endeavoring to transfer leadership to local church leaders early on. And I was wondering if you could share a practical example or two in your current context. Yeah, good, good question. So transferring leadership to local people early on. Um, <clears throat> so in our indigenous church plant, the first baptism that we had, I believe there were three people who were baptized. And then whenever there was the second group that wanted to get baptized, I asked, well, okay, so in the first group, there was one man and two women. So I, I sat down with the man and asked his opinion about the second group of applicants. Do you think they're ready? What do you see in their lives? You know, is, is this a good time to go ahead? I, I, I tried to get his insight into them because he knows them, you know. He knew them. He knew if, if um, there was evidence of, of conversion and all of that. And for me as an outsider, it's much more difficult to really see into their lives. So I included him in that decision. Doesn't mean that I necessarily put him on the preaching schedule, but I take his advice into account. Would you say that, or did you practice not baptizing or having the locals baptize the locals? Or what balance did you have there? So at this point, the way we do it is I typically lead out in the baptisms, but I always have a native brother help me 
And so we baptize by immersion. And so we have the person kneel in the water. I stand on one side. A native stands on the other side. And, and we baptize, or we, we dip the person together. And so in that way, I'm bringing them in. And at some point, I'll probably move on and let them take over. But I'm trying to include them in everything. Uh, maybe from more of a historical aspect, one, one of the things I've struggled with in the relating acts, relating um, the Jerusalem example of the groups of believers forming to a context, say, in, among um, indigenous people of the Americas, is we don't have an existing structure to work from. Um, the synagogue structure was already in place for 100 plus years, a couple hundred years in most of these communities. They already had a presence of the Word of God. They already had an example of a community um, that it was in their midst. Most of these worked out of that, I think, from a historical perspective. It's a little hard, in that sense, to pull it across. Yeah, you're right. That is true. <clears throat> Another thing is, for example, the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys, that was all urban church planting, or at least most of it was urban church planting. And, and he was working in the, some of the more civilized or developed cities of his day. And so the people that he was working with, a lot of them were intellectually developed. And I find myself working with people that are not intellectually developed, and they're, they're uneducated, they've not practiced leadership. I mean, you know, honestly, a lot of the guys that are, I'm working with, they used to be on the streets, you know, smoking pot, and they were bums. <laughs> and there's, there's a, quite a learning curve for these guys to become leaders. And sometimes it just takes a lot more time. Honestly, I think it does. And so, yeah, you're right. <clears throat> I have one question. Uh... Looking, coming, looking at, looking at uh, us, American church, and you referenced the fourth model of small congregations and then connecting as a large congregation. How, how, would, uh, how would you speak to us to inspire um, our local congregations to have, catch that vision? If we don't already have that vision, how would you uh, advise someone like myself to go home and, and um, propagate that vision? Are you in leadership at home? So maybe you have, you're in a platform where you could <clears throat> potentially make some small changes. Um, I'm not here to push that as the only model. That's not my, that's my, not my intention. <laughs> I just think it's biblical and I think it's good. I think it's resilient in difficult areas. Um, <clears throat> but I don't push it as the only thing. I really think that God's people need to have times when they are in a small group and just share, share their hearts. But if we only have a small house church that's disconnected from anyone else, house churches historically, or like one isolated house church historically has not done well. And I've observed house churches that fell apart. And so we need a broader network. So I'm not pushing this as some <clears throat> idealistic thing that we have to promote but I think it's good and that's what we're working towards is that model so I guess I guess uh, specifically we are working on planting several congregations at once and in several different villages and then trying to get that thing in, into a network and it's difficult because of the distance and all of that but that's what we're we're working on and I really think that you know, if at all possible, I think a church planting team should be planting multiple congregations at once. I did have one more thing on my notes that I didn't touch on. Uh, in the Global Church Planting book, <clears throat> he mentions that when, when churches are multiplying at every level, then church multiplication happens out of that. In other words, if disciples are making disciples, if cell groups are making cell groups, 
and leaders are raising up more leaders, then church multiplication happens. Many of us are coming from a background where disciples are not making disciples. Leaders are not raising up a lot of new leaders. They're not proactive in that. And I'm just here to tell you that there's going to be a learning curve. There was for me. I went to Mexico, and I went through about a 10-year learning curve, learning a lot of things. And I tell you, God took me through the wine press. God took me through a lot of difficult things to teach me these lessons. And <clears throat> there's going to be a learning curve getting some of this stuff figured out. We're not coming from a background of a lot of multiplication and a lot of success. There is going to be a learning curve.